After Brandon Stark was killed by the Mad King, Littlefinger sent a letter to Catelyn, and she burned it without reading it. Anyway, you're not going to believe this, but I figured out what the letter said. It went like this. Dearest Cat, Roses are red, violets are blue. I want you to know that I'm here for you. Your hair is auburn and violets are blue. I'm sorry our sovereign did this to you. Roses are red. Brandon was a bully. All I ever wanted was the prettiest Tully. Roses are red. Violets are blue. I banged your sister because I thought she was you. A mockingbird and trout I do ship. I'm still a giant below the hip. One fork is blue. The other is green. I'd swim up the red to be with my queen. Father and mother and maiden and crone, to whom must I pray to have you alone? Lysa got fat. With you I am smitten. If you'll be my cat, I'll call you my kitten. Eternally yours, Peter. <laughs> I guess some letters just deserve to be burned. What's up, guys? I'm back again to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire into this microphone. I think this time I want to try to talk about things that don't annoy me so much. Because I get kind of negative and and too much of that is never a good thing. So here's a topic that I don't think is likely to piss me off. It's called John is the Prince That Was Promised. It says Body John is the prince who was promised. I agree. That was me. It continues. I want to break down a part of the prince that was promised prophecy. The prince who was promised shall wake dragons from stone. Melisandre, a dance with dragons. John, as Rob's heir, would become a statue in the Winterfell crypts upon his death. Ah, I never thought of that. Well, he wouldn't, because he's a... He's a bastard, right? So, he wouldn't actually become a statue in the crypts. Unless he's not a bastard. Uh, because we know that traditionally, only kings in the north and lords of Winterfell had statues made in their crypt. Stone men. John is a stone dragon. A dead Stark Targaryen, or a stone man. Once resurrected, would be reborn into something new. I believe that once John, a dragon, is woken from stone, he will gain a fiery Targaryen nature. He will be more like his father's ancestors. All fire and blood for Ramsay Bolton once he rides south. <laughs> TLDR, John is a Targaryen. What? You don't need a TLDR for like eight sentences, dude. Furthermore, from the Duncan Egg novellas, Damon the Second Blackfire reports to Dunk a prophetic dream that he had about a dragon hatching. It turned out to be a metaphor for Egg finding his confidence as a Targaryen prince when confronted with Blood Raven. Oh, I don't remember enough about Dunk and Egg to speak on that, really. Hmm. So the crypt statue idea. It's an inter it's an interesting one at least. I never thought of that. Make dragons from stone. No, I don't think so. I think this is wrong. What are these guys saying about it? My current mind theory is that John is one third of the Prince of Prophecy, who is to be the Song of Ice and Fire. F R L J, F R L J. 
This is new. I'm seeing this a little more. People are saying if r plus l equals j. In the past, people would never say something like that. They would just like proceed uh, proceed with r plus l equals j unquestioningly. That's, that's kind of cool to see. A little more open-mindedness. Along with Danny, who woke the dragons from stones, and someone else, maybe Stannis, him sacrificing Shireen to bring forth Lightbringer. Maybe someone else who was, has completed the prophecy somehow. Yeah, I need to revisit the Princess Promised Prophecy. It's kind of been a while since I've really taken a, a crack at it. And I've learned a lot since then. So I might be able to get it this time. The dragon has three heads. Yep, that's part of it. There's a lot of pieces of it, and it's sort of scattered around the story. So you've got to sort of compile all of it. That's the first step. Because you have to account for all of it. You can't really leave pieces behind. If you're gonna, if you're gonna get it right, you've got to. It's got to account for everything. Maester Gildane is the prince who was promised. Wouldn't that be a surprise? This tertiary character that nobody cares about. It's him. He's the guy. Surprise. <laughs> but can John be both the prince that was promised and the stone dragon? How does he wake himself up? Yeah, he's kind of got the order wrong. Welp, too bad he's dead. Slash sarcasm. Yeah. Nimble Dick Crab was a Zora High. Westeros is doomed. <laughs> That's pretty funny. These guys are funny. They got a sense of humor in here so far. I like it. I'm just in the mood to revisit the Prince I was promised now. Let's do that. Prince that was promised. Forty four results. No, that's not a real one. It's just selling me prints and promise in proximity. All right, so this is the House of the Undying Vision version. This is uh, Rhaegar talking to Elia while holding Aegon the sixth baby. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there, beyond the door. There must be one more, he said. Though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. He went to the window seat, picked up a harp, and ran his fingers lightly over its silvery strings. Sweet sadness filled the room, as man and wife and babe faded like the morning mist, only the music lingering behind to speed her on her way. A Clash of Kings, Daenerys IV Oh, there was a line at the beginning of it that I missed that was kind of relevant. Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so... Huh. It's a huge passage simply because, for no, if for no other reason than the title drop... His is the Song of Ice and Fire. Holy smokes, right? Like, whenever, whenever an author incites the title of his book or his series in the story, it's, it's a huge deal. It's like, 
the biggest, uh, it's the loudest attempt to flag you down and get your attention. Like, hey, look at this. This is a big deal. Pay attention to this. Come back to this frequently and think about it. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of what I'm doing. <sighs> All right, so there's a, there's a Song of Ice and Fire, but it's an in-story A Song of Ice and Fire, apparently, because Rhaegar is literally saying it. Um, there's also a prophecy about a prince that was promised. <laughs> um, I already know that from other, I already know from other places that Rhaegar is uh, a singer. So it makes sense why the woman, I think it's Elia, she's, uh, Asking him if he'll make a song for him. Because she knows that Rhaegar is a singer too. That's his wife. Then he continues. There must be one more. He said. And whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed. She could not say. So the her here is Danny. Danny's watching this scene. Through a doorway. In the house of the undying. It's a vision. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that alone for now. Keep going. I think there's more mentions of the princess promise. Okay, so here's Danny asking about asking I think Jora about uh, the vision she saw. She nodded. Oh wait, hold on. A clash of kings, Daenerys five. She nodded. There was a woman in a bed with a babe at her breast. My brother said the babe was the prince that was promised and told her to name him Aegon. Prince Aegon was Rhaegar's heir by Elia of Dorne, Sir Jorah said. But if he was this prince that was promised, the promise was broken along with his skull when the Lannisters dashed his head against the wall. I remember, Danny said sadly. They murdered Rhaegar's daughter as well, the little princess, Rhaenys. She was named like Aegon's sister. <clears throat> there was no Visinia. But he said the dragon has three heads. What is the Song of Ice and Fire? Wow, that's really helpful, actually. So this is a follow-up to the first passage, and it's guiding our perceptions and our interpretations about how to interpret that first one. And, uh, so it's gonna, yeah, this is super important. This is going to tell us, this is, uh, this is gonna tell us what the author wants us to think about it and how the author wants us to think about it. Which is important to know, because the author's trying to mislead us. And so once I know how he's trying to make me think about it, that helps give me ideas about where to look for answers. I want to look in the places where I think he doesn't want me to look. Anyway, so, so Danny's asking Jorah, about the, the vision she saw. Prince Aegon was Rhaegar's heir by Elia of Dorne, Sir Jorah said. But if he was this prince that was promised, the promise was broken, along with his skull, when the Lannisters dashed his head against the wall. <sighs> so Jorah thinks the promise was broken. And so he thinks the... He thinks either the prophecy uh, was fake or false in some way, or that Rhaegar was wrong about, about the prophecy and who was the prince that was promised. The subtext is unclear, but it's one of those two things. I remember, Danny said sadly, 
They murdered Rhaegar's daughter as well. The little princess, Rhaenys, she was named. The little princess, Rhaenys, she was named. Like Aegon's sister. There was no Visenya, but he said the dragon has three heads. What is the Song of Ice and Fire? I need more of this passage. This isn't enough. Oh, let me get it. let me get the damn the book open. Clash. What is the Song of Ice and Fire? It's no song I've ever heard. I went to the warlocks hoping for answers, but instead they've left me with a hundred new questions. By then, by then there were people in the streets once more. Make way, Ago shouted. So that's it. That's the whole interaction. So Jorah's never heard of the song, the Song of Ice and Fire. So this is like a really obscure bit of prophecy or something that Rhaegar is talking about in the vision. I mean, it's at least obscure enough that Jorah doesn't know about it. So that's something to go on. Which kind of makes sense that the, the most obscure prophecy in the whole story would be uh, the title of the story. Because if you're going to put the title of the story in the story, you don't want to do it lightly. You want it to be like the the best of whatever it is. And so the most obscure prophecy is like the best prophecy. The sneak, It's the most sneaky, the most mysterious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get it. All right. I went to the warlocks hoping for answers, but instead they've left me with a hundred new questions. Yes, just like the prince that the prince that was promised prophecy did to the reader, where it didn't really answer anything, any of the questions we had. It was just like, here's some weird crap that you're not going to understand or know how to make sense of. Or even know how to begin making sense of. Enjoy. <laughs> hmm. Any more mentions of... Yeah. Here's one. Storm Davos 4. The conviction in the king's voice frightened Davos to the core. A hill in a forest... Shapes in the snow. I don't... It means that the battle has begun. Oh, that's Melisandre, sorry. It means that the battle has begun, said Melisandre. The sand is running through the glass more quickly now, and man's hour on earth is almost done. We must act boldly, or all hope is lost. Westeros must unite beneath her one true king, the prince that was promised. Lord of Dragonstone and Chosen of R'hllor. Okay. So she adds Lord of Dragonstone and Chosen of R'hllor. But it's unclear. It's unclear if that's part of the original prophecy or just her addition to it. And it seems like it's her addition to it. But I'm not so sure. If it's her addition, then I can't trust it. But if it's part of the prophecy, then uh, I have to take it into account. It would be a mistake to leave it behind. So from what I remember, the reason Melisandre thinks Stannis is the prince that was promised is because she heard a prophecy when she heard the prophecy, it was told that um, 
What was it? She interpreted the salt and smoke, the smoke and salt place, as being Dragonstone. And then when she went to Dragonstone, she found uh, Stannis there, who's like at the time was the the rightful, the rightful king, <laughs> the rightful. Uh, what do you call it? Not the heir. The one who had the, the right claim to the throne. When you consider that Joffrey was a, a bastard. And so when she found him there, she was like, yep, I totally was right that Dragonstone is the place of uh, salt and smoke and salt. That's what it is. I always forget the order. I think it's smoke and salt. But I always say salt and smoke. So anyway, from what I've learned uh, exploring Melisandre, she's... Um, the thing that's going on with her is that she's sort of cursed to, to be right the first time, but then to never learn that she was right. She... she the feedback she gets from the world regarding her prophecies and predictions is like, ha ha, you're wrong. You, you stupid prophet. You're bad at this. You suck. And that's the same feedback that the fans uh, tend to, the readers tend to um, have about her. And so the surprise is actually she's always right the first time. Um, And that's what was happening in uh, her Girl in Grey prophecy, for example. She predicted it was Arya. And then there was a passage that led the reader to discard Arya because of uh, Melisandre's just seeing what she expected to see, what she wished to see, and she wants to give good news to Jon because that's um, politically expedient at the time. And so we dismiss Arya, and we dismiss Melisandre, but in the end it's going to be Arya, who's the girl in grey, revealing that she was right the first time from the beginning. And the same thing happens with her, uh, some of her other prophecies, like one about Renly returning. So anyway, that's sort of the thing of Melisandre. It's the literary thing going on with Melisandre. It's that she was right the first time. So if her... If you think of her first um, prediction about the Prince of Promise prophecy as it's Stannis, well, we can all see that that's obviously wrong. Like... They have to, they have to literally fake the Lightbringer sword for him. And then... When characters see it, like Maester Aemon, well, he can't see, but you know what I mean. And uh, I think Davos and even Salador San doesn't buy it. Um, they think the sword is fake. That's not a. That's not the real Lightbringer. And so it's obvious to the characters, and it's obvious to the readers, that Stannis is not Azor Ahai, and he's probably not going to be Azor Ahai. Or the prince has promised. And I'm just going to sort of proceed on the assumption that those two things are the same thing. But they might not be. Anyway, if you think of um, Stannis is the prince that was promised as Melisandre's first prediction, then it's easy to understand why readers tend to think of Melisandre as an incompetent, blundering prophet. But if you think of Melisandre's first prediction as Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt, where the prince that was promised slash Azor Ahai will be reborn, um, that's not so self-evidently wrong. That could still be the place. And uh, so in accordance with uh, the literary sort of... Uh, thing going on with Melisandre. That's probably right. Dragonstone probably is the place where the prince that was promised will be reborn in smoke and salt.
Now there's a lot of questions like, what do you mean exactly by reborn? And what do you what do you mean by smoke and salt? And what does the smoke and salt even have to do with the prophecy exactly? But that's a good start, I think. Like supposing that Dragon's she was right about Dragonstone being the place where uh, the prince that was promised will be reborn. That's a big help. Like that narrows down the search a lot. Like how many people go to Dragonstone? Or how many people are likely to go to Dragonstone? I don't know, probably like 5% or less characters in the story. So we just we just narrowed the search by 95% of the characters in the story, approximately. I think that's amazing. But that's only if you buy my shit about Melisandre. But I think it's right. So that's where I'm at. Let me think about this a bit more. The promised part is interesting too because we tend to interpret it as this is a prince that was promised to society because as a member of society at least in Westeros you you're always hoping that the next king will be a good king. And so you're always hoping that the prince is a good prince because he's going to be the next king. And so a prince that was promised to society is, uh, it's sort of every prince in a way because every prince contains promise that it's going to be a good king. At least when they're babies. But as they get older, sometimes they turn out to be shitheads like Joffrey. But it can also be interpreted that the prince that was promised means that somebody made a promise to the prince. Anyway, the word promise is a pretty big deal in this story because there's these recurring memories that Ned has of a promise he made to promise or promises he made to Lyanna Stark when she was dying and these things don't have to necessarily be connected I mean the word promise comes up the word promise comes up uh, many times throughout the story many of them not relating to the prince that was promised nor Lyanna but it still seems significant Potentially, it's worth thinking about. When I look at these passages, I see uh, hyperlinks just all over them in certain phrases. So promises is one that links to, potentially links to all of the, the passages about Ned's promises to Liana. And ice and fire is one. And I think that might be the, the stronger inroad to this mystery. Because those, without a doubt, absolutely, certainly, uh, hyperlink to um, every other ice and fire in the series. For two reasons. It's a really specific phrase. Like, it's not the kind of thing that just comes up in normal conversation. It's also not the kind of thing that the author is going to accidentally put in the story, not realizing that it's the title of his series. And so... It speaks to a certain intentionality on the part of the author that's unmistakable. And there are two other ice and fire passages that I know of off the top of my head. One is Mira and Jojen Reed make an oath to Bran at Winterfell. And in it, they swear by ice and fire. And another one is Drogo's funeral pyre. Danny's having her people build the pyre out of sticks and kindling and stuff. And she thinks that she uses the term ice and fire in her mind, in her thoughts, to represent north and south, as in the directions that the sticks are laid and cross-laid. Now, I think 
a lot of fans make something of the judge and read and mirror read passage. And no wonder, like they're making an oath. It's sort of a big, a big in-story event, at least for those characters. And, um, the words they're choosing are, they're recited. They're not just some words they're making up on the spot. So that suggests that there's a history behind the words. People have said them before the, these people are saying them. And so they have some uh, some deeper meaning that way. But hardly anybody that I've seen talks about the ice and fire in Trogo's pyre. I've brought it up in the past for a discussion, and people mostly hand wave it. They're like, you know, that doesn't mean anything. You're reading too much into it. Gurm, please, we need the next book. <laughs> and one thing I can guarantee is that the ice and fire in Danny's funeral pyre is not an accident, and it's not insignificant. It's going to be extremely significant, um, and I already know how, but only because I figured out some things about the ending through a different route. I couldn't go through Drogo's funeral pyre to figure those things out. And so now what I have to do is sort of take what I know about the ending and then use it to help me figure out the the mysteries in, in between that I didn't have to pass through to figure out the ending and see if I can figure those out. Now, the ending is a dangerous term to just throw around, so I gotta acknowledge, like, there are as many endings as there are characters, and multiplied by layers of text. There's, like, the textual ending, where the text literally tells you what happens. And there's, like, the subtextual ending, where the text doesn't exactly tell you what happens, but you can put two and two together and figure out what happened and fill in the, fill in the details with a good amount of certainty. And then there's the metatextual ending that's like, okay, what's the takeaway of all of it? What's the lesson for me? And what does this reveal about what the author was trying to say with his story? Things like that. I have a lot to think about now. The relationship between the prince that was promised and uh, the ice and fire quotes. And then also the, the Ned's promise to Liana thread is also linked in that passage. And so all three of those things sort of come together. And it's the relationship between those three things that I'm going to be thinking about going forward. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. I hope it was okay. I'll see you next time.